Hello, Pokemon fans. This is Pro Pokedo back today to bring you another battle. Like I said yesterday in my upload, I promised you an educational battle, so today we are going to be looking at something very educational. It is something that is thrown around in a lot of uploads. People don't necessarily explain it in depth, so I decided to take it on and kind of bring some more substance back to this channel. The past few battles, they don't feel very substancy. I need a substance that's so substancy it's just thick of substance. I don't know. But today we are going to be talking about the safe play. Now the safe play is a term, like I said, that is thrown around a lot. Not many people actually understand what it, what it means to have a safe play because you know, you'll hear, oh, it's a safe play to just not overpredict in the very beginning. It's the safe it's safe for me to do this, or it's you know, that wasn't very safe of him or her to do at this point, right? So, generally the safe play is attributed to more of a cautionary move. I'm going to be bringing you something a little bit not conventional, because um, if you guys are, well, whether you're surprised about this or not, but I don't actually do a ton of research into Pokemon when I play it. I research when I don't know something. I like to learn more or less in battles and from other people teaching me and, you know, basically kicking my butt with certain stuff. So, that's basically how I've learned... Come on, Dehumidifier, seriously? Anyways, um... So, when I, when I think of the safe play, I don't necessarily want to think of it as just cautionary, because there are safe plays and safe times to predict. There are safe times to risk. There are safe times to do stuff like that. So, I want to put it out to you, ladies and gentlemen, today through two battles. There's going to be a UU battle against a person by the name of Lee the Fan, a League of Legends player, but also a very good Pokemon player, and an OU match against a person by the name of Ew Metagross. And we all know Ew Metagross. I'm going to put his link in the description below if you guys want to go check out his channel yet again, or if you haven't even heard of him, go check him out. He's an excellent, excellent battler and a fantastic friend. So, those will be the two battles that I'll be using as examples. But first, I'm going to be going through a little bit of a tutorial, I suppose. It's going to be... Um, I'll try and make it as simple as possible, but the goal of today is to show you guys that the safe play is not necessarily just a cautionary thing, it can be more of an appropriate move, not so much, you know, playing on the defense, it's more or less knowing what to do. So, let's just get straight into this explanation. So I have, I've created three factors of the safe play, and one quick second, because I'm just going to make sure that I can see where the heck I'm going here. There we go. That hopefully wasn't in the way too much. I just want to make sure that you guys can see the words properly and stuff like that. So, um, I've come up with three factors of the safe play. And the three factors, these are based off of things that I've done, off of experiences that I've had, and stuff like that. So, when I think of the safe play and when to make a safe play, cautionary play, appropriate play, I think of three different types, three different things. In the battle, first of all, you have to look at the Pokemon. Now, the three factors I'm going to say right now apply to both myself and the opponent. So, yourself and your opponent as well. Okay, so the first thing that I think about are the Pokemon. So, obviously, if I'm thinking about the Pokemon, I have to look at the types of Pokemon that we're looking at here. So, generally, if you're an OU, you're, you're more or less going to find a Steel type. If you're an U, you're more or less going to find a Grass type. Stuff like that, right? So, you have to look at the types of the Pokemon that you're actually dealing with. The second thing you have to look at as well, what are the abilities of these Pokemon? So, for example, Gastrodon with the Storm Drain, or uh, Evire with the Motor Drive, stuff like this, right? You have to think about the different abilities when you're choosing a move. And that can affect whether or not you want to do it. So, let's just go for a quick example. You have a Pokemon with Volt Switch, and they have a Ground type. What are the chances that it's going to be a safe play for you to go to the Volt Switch in the beginning of the game versus the end of the game? And that's where these rolls come in. The next thing to get about Pokemon are rolls. So let's say you're most likely going to find on an opponent's team, you're going to find a wall, you're going to find a sweeper, you're going to find a statuser, a physical wall, special wall, stuff like that. So when you're making a play or when you're making a move, such as a switch, or um, trying to get them caught in, a, in those corners that you like to set up on them, you have to think about the different roles that are on their team and which roles have been removed from your team and their team. So, if you've lost your physical wall, how do you deal with their physical sweeper? Stuff like that. And the last thing, obviously, are the moves. So, I mean, generally, you're going to assume that if you see someone with uh, cosmic power and combine and stuff like that, you might think there might be a store power. You think there's going to be a stab move on their way, or you might think they're more defensive. So moves are a very large indicator, sometimes, of what type of Pokemon you're dealing with. Not all the time, though. And of course, you have to remember when I'm telling you this stuff, this doesn't necessarily apply always to every situation, um, because people like me like to mix it up, like my Toxic 3 Attack Shaman. 
I mean, you put Toxic on a Pokemon that generally you want to be a Stall Breaker or a Wall Breaker or just get status and more of a bulky Pokemon, but my shame it is max special attack, max speed. So, it serves a different role for me, but, you know, not many people, well, most people read into it and go, okay, it's got leftovers, it's got Toxic, it's gonna be bulky. Wrong. Anyways, so, the first thing you want to look at are Pokemon. The second thing you want to look at, using my fancy Microsoft Word, is Team Composition. So now you've looked at the Pokemon, you know what your Pokemon do, you know what the abilities you have at your disposal, you know what your opponent can do. Now you gotta look at what's actually on the team. So now you have to look at the roles on the team. So, let's choose a quick example here. I keep going to OU because that's the only thing I can think of. Let's try something different. Are you? Okay, Kabutops. Okay, Kabutops is an offensive Pokemon, generally in the rain. So if you look at the team and you see a Kabutops and then you see stuff like Mesprit, Okay, the first thing you can maybe think of is maybe this is a rain team, or perhaps Kabutops is just a Swords Dance Sweeper, stuff like this, right? So when you look at a team, you have to look at the Pokemon on the team, and you have to think about, you know, what type of roles they could serve. Now, obviously, um, if you guys have played me, I like to make a few assumptions in the beginning, and if you've watched my previous uploads, I like to make a few assumptions in the beginning just to give myself a base. Now, this does not mean that I'm going to always go off that assumption because people generally carry surprises, like I like to do. So, you know, just because most people like to play with surprises, I like to play with surprises, and therefore I assume if something is scarfed in the beginning, I like to check it with a Pokemon that would be safe enough to do it, and then that's considered a safe play. Right? Just making a Pokemon be Death Fodder, and then it'll help me discover whether or not this Pokemon is the role that I think it is on the team. Now, another thing about the safe play is leads. So, with leads, okay, that's the most important thing in the beginning of a game. You just have to figure out what they could lead with, and what your best lead is. So, you can't always come up with a Pokemon that will just counter everything that could be put out, right? So, you have to look at the team composition, think about what could you lead with, and what could they lead with. Obviously, it's not very cautious to lead with your physical sweeper unless you know their team cannot handle it. And I'm going to put out there nine and a half times out of ten, you will not find a trainer who can be swept by one Pokemon unless the team is either built very poorly and or your Pokemon is just too good. So, um, I would generally say that applies to just not in the beginning at least. If you lead off turn one, you can start setting up and sweeping them. Their team is either weak or there's no counter to it. So... Um, generally there is going to be a counter, so obviously their team is not prepared for it, and trust me, I've run into many situations like that, where I just can't beat it. Cough, cough, Lugia. And the final Pokemon is Threats. Okay, the fi final Pokemon? Wow. The final consideration in team composition is Threats. Now, when I say Threats, I don't mean Terrakion, okay? Terrakion is not a threat unless your team cannot handle it, or cannot handle it appropriately. Okay, and that's when you have to play even safer. And this is where the safe play becomes very, very important, because um, if you know that there's a Pokemon that counters your team, or a type of Pokemon that counters your team, such as if you have a mainly physical team, you know a physical wall that would exist in that tier is going to counter your team, you obviously need to play around it, and you need something to take it down. Which means that you now need to keep those Pokemon that are important to take those Pokemon down alive, and that's where it becomes the beauty of Pokemon, just that complication. So... Threats don't necessarily mean the threats to the tier, it more or less, to me, means threats to the um, team that you have. Okay, so do not assume that just because a Pokemon is a big-ass threat, as Pokemon says, it just means that there is a threat that you need to counter if it's going to cause your team problems. Which can also be an anti-lead, which can be a sweeper, stuff like that. So, that's the second factor to consider team composition. Now, the third factor... Oops, there we go strategy. Okay, so now you're going to look at the trainer, him or herself, and yourself, okay? So obviously the biggest thing you have to look at are patterns of play. Now, I would say this factor is probably the most, is, is very important in trying to actually determine when to make a safe play versus a risky play, because this pretty much covers the three things you need to look at, okay? The patterns of play, which basically means, is your, po is your opponent making a lot of obvious moves? Are you making a lot of obvious moves? And are they catching on? Which leads me into predictions. Now, predictions, okay, they're good. Okay, they are good, they are very risky, and they are very dangerous. They can put someone in lead, or they can put someone behind very easily. Okay, just by a simple matter of one to two predictions. It can put you, like, three Pokemon ahead, or you're down 1v6. So, um, predictions have to be based off of how you see how they're playing, 
and whether or not you choose to cut them off. Because there are times where you can predict and say, okay, he's definitely going to switch in that Manectric onto my T-Bolt, so I'm going to go straight for the HP Ice. You could do that easily, but the, pro but the question that you have to ask is, is this prediction appropriate at this time of play? Is it really important for me to take out that Flygon right now because I know that that Heracross will come in and take me out with a Stone Edge? You know, there's situations like that. So, predictions can be dangerous, it can also be good, so you have to consider when to make that type of appropriate play. Same thing with feigning or faking an item. When you have an item, per se, um, and you want to fake, especially a choice scarf, is usually the one you like to fake a lot, right, with an expert belt or lumberry or something like that. When you're trying to fake an item, you need to, you need to try and figure out, when can I reveal that I am actually not choiced? and it'll get me the advantage, or it will not get me the advantage. Is it even worth it v revealing that I'm not choiced? Or stuff like that, right? So that's, that's another thing you have to consider. And the final thing which we will be talking about is the risk versus the reward. This is probably the thing that both battles will show you, risk versus reward. Um, at one point the risk will cost me a game, the other time the risk will cost... Uh, well, it won't cost the opponent the game, but it makes sense put into context, and I have to put it into context for you because I'm sure half of you will be scratching your heads going, why the heck did you both go and do that? So, um, the risk versus the reward, obviously, I believe Shofu put a battle, or um, an upload out about this, and risk versus reward is a very basic concept. Basically, you want to go for the, for the best move that gets you the greatest amount of reward, and you don't want to go for a risk, like switching in a Landorus onto a Rotom Wash that could be going for Hydro Pump, stuff like that. So, you want to make sure that you deal with getting more reward, rather than getting too much risk. And for me, if I have someone with an electric move, or a volt switch, or something like that, and I've used it once or twice, I will never use it as long as the team has a ground type. Same thing with just anything that can be immune. I will not use a psychic type move if someone has a dark Pokemon that keeps switching in, because that gets me stuck, and then that dark Pokemon can easily have Pursuit, for example, stuff like this, right? So. Or anything can have Pursuit, but mainly Dark types get a more powered up Pursuit. But th what I'm saying is, you know, I like to play extremely defensively. You guys know that. I like to play Stall, but I haven't been playing it lately because I've been trying to get, um, you know, faster battles for you guys. Not necessarily faster, but, you know, more skill-based, and, you know, Stall is unfortunately um, destroyed some tiers. But anyways, that's these are the three things that I came up with when it comes to the safe play for me. Now, this might not necessarily be explained the safe play too much, but I think these battles will. So let's look into the team previews now. Um, the first battle, like I said, will be a standard UU match. Looking at my opponent's team, there are threats to my team. Okay, so just because Raikou and Chandelure and Heracross and all of them are big threats, actually, this team carries five threats to UU, really. Um, now keep in mind this is pre-black and white too, I don't think these Pokemon necessarily change because of that, but, um, obviously Flygon is a threat to everyone, uh, Heracross is a threat to everyone, Chandelure is a threat to everyone, it doesn't necessarily scare me, Flygon doesn't scare me because I have Manectric, and Manectric is Scarf, therefore it's faster and can take it out with an HP Ice, no problem. Raikou doesn't necessarily scare me, because if I cut it off from Subcom Minding or anything like that, I'm, I'm not in a position to be panicking, and I have Swampert if he's going to be going for electric moves. So these are the types of things that I'm talking about. People say there's this big-ass threat in this tier when it's... it's it, if you have a Pokemon that counters it, it's, it's not really threatening. So, um... In this battle, I'm going to lead off with Swampert, just because I want to get the hazards up, and I'm not too afraid of his Pokemon taking me out. It'll also help me scout the Pokemon that he has, because Crustal and Yu might be doing something a little bit different than what it does in OU, or not in OU, in RU, wow. And, um, anything else that wants to come in, I mean, the Raikou is going to be covered mostly, unless he's carrying HP Grass for some weird reason. Uh, Chandelure could have the Energy Ball, but that would tell me whether or not I need it, because Hazards are not really going to damage his team too, too much, but obviously if I can get him up, they're nice. So, that's the first battle. The second battle that I'll be showing you guys is the OU match against U Metagross, and just looking at the teams quickly, again, he's got a Landorus, he's got a Terrakion, he's got a Rotom Wash, but I'm not afraid of them because Terrakion, I've got Gliscor, and Gliscor is a hard counter to Terrakion, in quotations, but... Um, Rotom Wash, I have a specially defensive Jirachi. Landorus, I can deal with it depending on the move that it goes for and the item. And as you will see, I play very defensively around this. So, the first battle, the UU match, is basically going to be demonstrating a lack of knowledge and what the safe play can do with a lack of knowledge and how it can actually bring about a different strategy that would work 
if you knew it would actually do the amount of damage that you thought it would do. So obviously there's a hint that something is going to be going on in the battle that's going to kind of, you know, screw one person or the other over. And in the second battle, which... No, you know what, I'll explain the second battle later. Just focus on the UU match, and now I will see you at the battle. So, I hope you guys haven't necessarily gotten extremely tired from watching this. It will be a very long upload, as I realize. And if half of you have skipped just to the battles, I invite you to go back to the beginning and watch everything that I've said because I will not be touching on a lot of stuff that I talked about in the beginning and I realize I didn't put a lot of detail into it but I just wanted to bring you guys the basis of it I mean going into detail I'm gonna make it I'm gonna become like a high school teacher grilling you guys in the middle of summer over an hour of talking about this stuff in depth if you guys want to do that on a side then you can Skype me find me on PO stuff like that you guys can talk to me there then and you obviously can leave your opinions in the section below because I'll be trying to go into detail um, during these battles, but I more or less just want to point out certain things that I've already talked about. So, um, like I said, I'm going to lead off with the Swampert. My opponent is going to decide to lead off with Chandelure. Now, the funny thing about this is... I'm actually just going to pause this right here. The funny thing about this leadoff is I know Chandelures can carry Energy Ball, and for me, I don't actually care if Swampert dies. What I, what I want to check for is see what item it has. So right away, I'm going to go straight for the Skull. And what do you know, Chandler goes for, stealth, uh, for Substitute. So if I went for Stealth Rocks, I would have been in a much worse position than usual. And considering that he left off with, led off with it, it could have easily looked like, hey, it's a Scarfer. But I wanted to see what my opponent is thinking already. So he goes straight for the Energy Ball, revealing that Energy Ball is present and that he is a sub-3 attack Chandelure with leftovers. This is very good information because I know now that my Miss Magius can outspeed it. But instead what I'm going to do is switch into my Machamp that's threaten it out with a Payback. But I know he's not going to stay in. So I'm going to go for the Earthquake because it is the safest move. Now when I say safest, uh, I'm going to slow this down a lot. How is that the safe play? What a, why am I talking about safe play when I'm not even touching on the safe play? Earthquake hits everything but Flygon. Now Flygon doesn't threaten me because it can hit me, but I'm not really concerned about it. So Earthquake will hit if he stays in, Chandelure for super effective damage. If he switches into Suicune, hit it. Raikou, super effective. Heracross, not too much. And Crustle, equal. But, I mean, I could have gone for Dynamic Punch, but if he had stayed in, I would have put myself in a horrible position. So that's why I went for Earthquake. That's what I mean by the safe play. It was appropriate based on his team types, and it's appropriate based on the moves that I have. So now the Crustle is going to fall, and I'm just going to speed this up a little bit more here. So that's, that's kind of what I meant, and... Um, now he's going to switch into Heracross. Now the safest thing I could do is just easily switch out and assume the fighting type. Because at this point he's already been playing very risky, so I figured he's probably going to try and switch up his pattern. So now I can kind of read his pattern. He goes into Flygon, I go for the Substitute. Very safe. Now how is this safe? Because if he switches out, then I know he's choiced. If he stays in, then I know he's not. And he has to reveal that and hit me with something like a Mega Horn. So I'm just basically collecting data about my opponent, the way he's going to play, looking at the type of Pokemon that he has, and what do you know, it's helping me. So now that I know he outspeeds me, he's most likely the Scarfed. Because, well, no, he is the Scarfed because he outsped uh, Miss Magius. So now I can switch into Escavalier because he is locked into Outrage. Again, safe, which is cautious because I know the Outrage is resisted and that I'll be able to take it easily since I'm max HP, knowing my Pokemon. So now he's going to get confused. I can take him out with the Iron Head because he is locked in. Crit doesn't matter because Escavalier is a beast with max attack, adamant nature. So now he's going to switch into his Chandelure. Now, uh, this guy is still important to me for the, I think the Raikou? I'm not sure. But I keep him anyways because I figured if I switch into this Magius to be Death Fodder, it's the best thing to Death Fodder. I don't know why. Just to be quite honest, I'm not sure why I went on a fodder this thing, because I know I'm faster than it, but at this point, I don't think I was thinking that. What I was thinking was, hey, maybe I could just bait him to go for something and then switch into my Manectric safely? I'm not sure. I'm actually not sure. Maybe I made a mistake here with the play that I made, but it would have made a lot more sense for me just to leave uh, Escavalier in and then send this thing out, because I know I'm faster. But anyways, I'm just going to go straight up for the Shadow Ball, knowing that I am faster since I was able to set up the sub, and I already know that it's a Leftovers one. But now he's going to go for the Combine. Now, this information is important because I know it is a sub-combine. And now, I went for Pain Split because if he wants to take out Miss Magius, I didn't care at this point. He can take it out because I can send him a champ and go for EQs or go for Dynamic Punches. So, but the Pain Split, the good thing about the Pain Split is if 
I risk the pain split, the reward will be HP. If I don't hit the pain split, then the reward will be I lose Miss Magus and get a free switch. So at that point, it was pretty good for me to go for. So now he's going to go for the T-Bolt, not kill me, which is unfortunate because he is at plus one, and you would think that it would do a lot more damage. But now I'm going to go for the Shadow Ball, break his special defense out, which is good. And um, now I'm going to follow my own life orb. But that gives me a free switch into whatever I want, and in this case, it's going to be actually Manectric. And I'm gonna go for the Overheat, which is gonna burn all of his Pokemon. Now his Chandelure is dead, so I can safely go for the Overheat. I wouldn't go for Overheat if his Chandelure was not dead. And that's because if I switch in, I'm locked into it, Flash Fire is gonna boost him, and something else that I have to switch out into is gonna take a plus, I think plus one Fire Blast, and that's really not good because I don't have anything. Swampert is dead. So in that case, I definitely would not risk it, and I would not make that safe play for going for Overheat, which would hit Raikou and for sure kill it, because that would just get me in a worse position. So that would be a, more of a risk um, than a reward. But anyways, he's going to switch into a Suicune as I go into my Shaman. This Shaman is actually my growth 3 attack Shaman. I switched it recently to toxic 3 attacks. But basically what you're going to see here is a couple of setups. Now we're pretty much both safe to set up. I know that I'm bulky enough to take an Ice Beam at plus 1. So I'm safe to set up, try and get as much damage off on Suicune because I know it's getting special defense. So here at plus two, as you can see, it's not going to take me out. I know it's not going to take me out. And I also know I'm most likely not going to take it out with a plus two Seed Flare. Although it does a significant amount of damage, it actually removes the special defense again, which is kind of lucky. But he's going to take me out with the Ice Beam. Not a big concern because I still have Manectric. Now, uh, he has Heracross and Suicune left, so T-Bolt is the safest move to go for. It's the most appropriate move to go for. 100% accuracy, and I know for sure it's going to hurt both Pokemon. Now here, I need to put something into perspective. Okay, I could have gone for the T-Bolt, and I figured, okay, if I go for T-Bolt, this thing is going to be faster than my Escavalier and my Machamp, which means close combat, if this thing is most likely banded, which I think it is because his Flygon was Scarf, would be the most dangerous thing for me in the world because I know a T-Bolt's not going to kill maybe even without a crit. So what I decided to do was fodder off my Pokemon because I know he has to go for close combat. So my theory here is if I can get his special defense really low to the point where I can actually take him out with a T-Bolt, then I'll be able to go for the safest move. 100% accuracy, I will take this match. Now, I don't know if you guys have been keeping up with what I was saying, but I told you guys that there's going to be a mistake made on, on a player's part, and this is where it's going to be made with a lack of knowledge. Now, the lack of knowledge here is that I didn't know how much T-Bolt was actually going to do. I didn't run a damage calc. At this point, I'm like, okay, this guy just wants to get the heck out of here. I'm not going to run a damage calc. Now, there are two things that I could have done. I could have gone for a T-Bolt with minus two special defense, which will obviously hit because it's 100% accuracy, and I'm stabbed, so that's base 142.5 damage, uh, base attack, or base power, and then plus attack and whatever. But I could have gone for overheat, which is 10% less, but base 280. Now, what makes sense here? Well, he's at minus two special defense. This is what's running through my mind. Minus two special defense. I could take him out with a T-Bolt. No, because Heracross has a little bit too much special defense for my liking, and he's going to be able to take me out with a banded close combat. Now, is this dumb? No, I wouldn't say this is dumb. If I saw an opponent do this, or if I saw anyone do this, I would not tell them they're dumb. And you know why? Because the logic was there. Minus two special defense. Even my opponent didn't expect me to not kill him. So he expected me to take him out. And... You know, we both agreed. You know what? That was probably the smartest thing I could have did. Because if I had missed Overheat, that would have been even worse. But, I mean, when it, obviously in hindsight, hey, oh yeah, I could have gone switched out, switched back into Manectric and Overheated. But what if I had missed? And then hey, Machamp would be left and I'm dead there, right? Or I could do this thing where I weaken their special defense, go for the T-Bolt and hit them. So, in a sense, yeah, I, I may have lost that for myself. But when you look at it in perspective and hear what the person was thinking, which is, hello, me, um... It makes more sense, and it was logical to do, and it was actually a good move on my part. I thought of it, I'm like, hey, you know, this could have been a good move. It's just unfortunate that I didn't know the damage calcs, and I ran it after. I had no chance of o -coing. I think it was like 90, it was like 89 to 94% or something, something, some number like that, really close. So if I had Stealth Rocks up in the very beginning, then obviously I would have won this. But I didn't, and you know what? I had to deal with it. But let's get to the second match now. That was an excellent match, Lee the Fan. This second match, this is going to be interesting because this one is when you're playing someone whose playstyle is exactly like yours. And you, Metagross, and me both like to try and predict the heck out of each other, like to play defensively, and like to trick each other. So, um, 
with battles like this, the safe play kind of goes out the window, <laughs> in a, in a, to a certain extent. I, w I would honestly argue that I play more of a safe... Pl uh, no, you know what? I'm not going to argue it. We both play very safely. Let's just get into this because this is going to be have to be sped up because there's like 61 moves to this turn. But anyways, I'm going to lead off with my Jirachi. He decides to lead off with his Rotom Wash. This is fine for me because I know it can take any hits, and if he wants to give me a trick, I don't really care. He's going to go straight for the Volt Switch as I go for the Body Slam, which will hit all of his Pokemon. Getting a Paralysis off on any of his Pokemon, I don't really care at this point. I just want to paralyze something. It happens to be the Fortress, which is kind of sucky, but oh well. Now I'm going to go for the Wish in case he decided to switch out and bring in a threat that could hurt me, and that's going to make it safe for my, for my Gliscor to come in and set up its Toxic Orb easily. So it doesn't matter if the Wish has gone to waste, it's going to allow me to get him in safe, even if he decided to send something in. But now I'm going to double switch into my Lucario because I figured if this guy's just going to stay in and go for spikes, if this guy, if it was going to decide to stay in and go for spikes, I can start setting up nasty plots and try to get an early sweep going off. Now I do understand that he has his Landorus out, and Scarf or not, it's going to be faster than me, but I forgot I got plus four special attack, this should hurt. And here, I'm going to go for the Vacuum Wave, just out of pure curiosity, to be quite honest. I was, I asked him, I said, you know, I'm just going to go for Vacuum Wave, I'm just going to let you kill me, I want to see how much it does, and plus four, obviously, is not going to do a lot, hey, but that's not a half bad. This part, though, oh my goodness, okay. Safe play, okay. I go for Protect to check to see if he has a Choice Scarf. He decides to reveal to me, try and catch me off guard. Now, why is that safe for me? It was safe for me, I saw Starmie die, it's not a big deal. It was safe for me to go for the Protect, obviously because, I mean, he knows the Protect could most likely be coming, which could reveal that now I am a Toxic Stalling Gliscor, but he might have already known that because he watches my stuff and he's played with me, and I think he suggested this thing to me, I can't remember, but... Um, he now has revealed to me that he's not Scarf. This is extremely important to me because my Scarfer is uh, dead. And so that means I do have to play around it because Starmie was actually my Scarfer. So the U-turn did take it out. Now at this point, it's going to become a matter of out-predicting him between the Earthquake and the HP Ice because both those moves are going to take my Gliscor and Jirachi out respectively. So I have to see what way he's playing. Now here, I believe I'm going to predict him to go for the HP Ice, predicting my Gliscor to come out. Which, you know, is, is kind of smart. Unfortunately, though, I do have to also realize that if I'm going to do that, I need to assume, or I need to know, that the Earthquake will not kill me. But, you know, not knowing that, it's going to kill me. But now I'm going to go into Haxorus, try and fake that I'm Scarf, maybe. Try and just go for that, and um, make him assume that I'm going to hurt him a lot. But he's going to go for U-turn, checking this. I also figured he might want to switch out using that, just to see. But he's going to switch out, go into his Fortress to take a hit, I believe, and I go for the Dragon Claw, yeah, just in case he decided to stay and go for EQ, or overpredict and just switch, or something like that. But, now he knows I'm not Scarfed. It was kind of a weird thing, because he could have gone for HP Ice and killed me, but, you know, he's playing just as defensively as I'm playing. And I'm trying to watch the battle while explaining this, and looking at my notes and everything like that. I hope this is going okay so far. I know it's extremely long, you guys obviously should have taken a break by now, I would have. But, um... I'm going to go for the U-turn now, thinking he might want to switch, but um, now what I'm going to do is predict him to go for the Bolt Switch and set up my Gliscor to cut him off from his Switch Advantage, and that's exactly what happens, because I know he's going to keep trying to get the Switch Advantage to the Volt Turning. So by sending out Gliscor, I have now cut off his Volt Turn Advantage, and now that means he has to send in something to take a hit. Now, here I go for Substitute, um, which is a safer move. Because if I had gone for Toxic and he had stayed in, that would have been a waste of a turn, and he's going to get a free to layer of Toxic Spikes, which really doesn't matter to me, because Haxorus has the Lumberry, and Infernape's going to be really the only thing that's going to be poisoned right now. But, um, Substitute also allows me if he sent in something like Landorus or something with an Ice move, or something that would just basically threaten me, which is his Kingdra as well, I would be basically behind a sub, and I can respond appropriately from there. Now I'm going to start going for Earthquakes, and I think at this point it's going to become a giant stall war, so I'm just going to speed it up to death. There we go. And, um... He's gonna basically try and waste my EQs. Now, I got 16 EQs, I got 16 Toxics, and I have, uh, 24 Substitutes. So basically, what he's gonna be trying to do is trick me here. And he's gonna just try and bait me to keep going for Earthquake, because, as you can see, it's not doing a lot to his Fortress. And I have to predict when he's gonna send out that Landorus. Because... Um... You know, it's going to become a matter of, if I can get that Landorus poisoned, no problem. If I get that Rotom Wash poisoned, no problem. I need one. I need those both threats to my team taken out. So now that the Landorus comes in, I go for the EQ, don't predict it that time, but I'm going to now remember that he's trying to PP stall me. So I have to keep this in mind. But as you can see, he's not breaking my sub, so I'm kind of in a good position at this point. I thought he would go for HP Ice there, so I went for Toxic. 
but I'm in a pretty good position because as you can see he's just kind of out predicting me at this point but I need to make my move eventually I need to think when he's going to switch out so what I'm thinking is he's gonna try and get my substitute hurt enough with rapid spins and try and trick me to keep going into an infinite loop of earthquakes that this next turn right here I'm gonna go for the toxic he's low enough on HP where he can come back and get some recovery and all that stuff so here I go for the toxic and I catch his Landorus on the switch that is how you outplay an outplayer who's outplaying you. So now he's going to switch back in. I go for the protect, which is safer, because in case he wants to make a switch with U-turn or something like that, I cut that off, and I know that's what he's going to try and do. If he tries to break my sub, I now know that he's going to try and stay in and break my sub. And if he sends out something like Fortress, it's not a waste of a turn, because I'm still behind my sub, and I'm just getting toxic... Wow, poison heal recovery over and over and over again. So at this point, I know he's going to... I'm thinking he's going to try and switch out... But I think I just go for EQ anyways. Because now he sends in this thing, I'm like, well, oh yeah, he's got Rotom Wash who can do this as well. So, um, this is the longest death ever, as I say on the side. I go for Protect again, just to make sure that he is not going to try and break it. Now I go for Toxic, predicting him to switch out again. But that was also a bad move on my part, because now he, since he predicted that on me for playing defensively, uh, he has an extra turn to live with his Fortress and hit me with Rapid Spins. But now I'm thinking he's going to let this thing stay in and die. So I think I go for the EQ, but he sends in his Landorus again. Now this, to be quite honest, if he had kept sending in his um, Rotom Wash, it would have been better because then he wouldn't be taking extra toxic damage. But now he's going to switch out. I go for Substitute predicting him to break my sub. And now he's going to make a double switch, go back into his hairpiece. I, go, I can go for toxic safely because I still have a lot of toxic left, a lot of toxic PP left. But now I'm going to go for protect. He goes for the U-turn. Now I know he's going to try and just keep getting the switch advantage going on to me. But I'm cutting off Volt Turn. He breaks my sub. He switches out. He goes into his Kingdra as I go for another substitute, pretty much knowing that he's going to try and just take this thing out. He's going to go for a Scald. I believe I go for the toxic on this thing because I, I knew previously that it was Life Orb. So this will be very nice between Life Orb and Toxic, but now he's going to switch out, go into his hairpiece. I can go for the Substitute, predicting him not wanting to stay in, because I, th I at this point, we're just confused with each other, I think. Um, we're just, like, we're quite literally staying on the side. We're too smart for each other. We know what we're both going to do. So it also becomes a matter of just hacks, and as you can see, I missed the Toxic, which kind of sucks. But now he gets his rocks up. I'm behind a lot of hazards as I get a crit on him. He goes for the Roar. Brings in my Haxorus now here. Okay. This part right here. Okay. This is where it becomes interesting. Because he's got all his Pokemon except his Fortress. Oh, not that his Fortress. Is it his Fortress? What died? Crud. Okay, but he's got five of his Pokemon. I have Mold Breaker. This is where the abilities come in. If he wants to switch in Rotom Wash, it dies. If he wants to switch in uh, Landorus, it's going to die. I think Land Landorus died. Oh, this is bothering me. This is bothering me. Who died? Did he die yet? Yes, okay. His Landorus is dead. Okay. He wants to switch in Fortress, it's going to die. He wants to switch in Rotom Wash, it'll die to an Earthquake. If he wants to switch in Kingdra, it'll die to a Dragon Claw. If he wants to keep his Territory in, it's going to die to a Dragon Claw. If he switches in Terrakion, it's going to take unnecessary damage. So, what is the move that I should go for? I'm going to let you think about it for a quick second. Earthquake or Dragon Claw? Because thinking about it, okay, I have Mold Breaker, which can hit 1, 2, 3, 4, all of his Pokemon. And how many of them for super effective damage? Two of them. How many can it kill? Four of them. I can go for Dragon Claw, though, on the off chance he's going to switch into Kingdra. So what I decide to do, because I know I'm going to live to two, I'm going to live to two turns here, I go for the Earthquake. It's going to hit four of his Pokemon, which is the safest thing, right? He brings in Kingdra, no problem, right? But now what he's going to do is bring in his Rotom Wash, forgetting... Oh, no, I don't forget. He's going to go for the Bolt Switch. I, it's pointless for me to switch out, because it's just going to be Death Fodder for later, and he's going to get the Switch Advantage anyways. <laughs> But now he brings in his Kingdra. Between Toxic and Sandstorm, I figured I could bring in my Infernape. Fake that I'm Scarfed. I think I am Scarfed, actually. And he's going to switch out, fearing that I am Scarfed as I go for the close combat. He's going to let his Fortress be Death Fodder, which is an excellent move on his part. But now, obviously, he's just going to keep taking damage every time that thing comes in. So... At this point, he's going to go into his Rotom Wash. And then he's going to make a double switch, still fearing that I'm a Scarfed, and he switches out. But I'm just going to stay in because I frankly don't give a crap anymore. I need to stay in and hurt his di and hurt his Pokemon. So he's still on the assumption that he's uh, that I am Scarfed when I am actually banded. So now he's going to bring in his Terrakion, take me out with a Rock Slide, and now it's down to this. It's down to my Gliscor versus his Terrakion and his Rotom Wash. Now you'd think in this place I'd be, I'd be in a bad position because he still has his Rotom Wash. However, this big-ass threat in the tier right now is being walled. 
because I have my Gliscor out, and I'm going to be able to stall him out, and all he has is Rock Slide. He doesn't even have Stone Edge. Now, that's, I'm not saying Rock Slide is a bad thing, and I'm not saying you Metagross is a dumbass. What I am saying is he's actually making the good move right here. He's got 90% accuracy going. He can flinch me. And I mean, why would you want to risk 80% in a crit when I could easily stall him out of his 8 stone edges, right? He's got 16 rock slides you can keep using. Unfortunately, he's not going to get that lucky because I believe on this turn I get a substitute off. And looking at the damage that he's doing, I can actually have my substitute take 2 rock slides at a time. And he's going to be put in a bad position. So I'm just going to go for protect just to get more health back. So that on the off chance that he gets a crit on breaking my substitute... I'll be able to be safely making another one. And here you go, got another rock slide. Not gonna break my sub. I believe I go for the toxic here just so that I can get recovery or um, residual damage off on him. Because on the off chance that he does get a crit, the safest thing for me right now is for him to take building up damage and he'll have to switch into his Rotom Wash if he wants to keep his Terrakion alive. But because he knows that Terrakion is hard countered by this Gliscor, why would he switch out? Why would he want me to be Gliscor? If, on the, if I can take out his Rotom Wash by stalling it as much as this, and he only has, same thing, eight, wa eight Hydro Pumps or whatever other move, <coughs> excuse me, that he's going to go for, why on earth would he want to switch it out? It's most sense for him to fodder off his Terrakion to get his Rotom Wash in here safely. Now, last pause, I swear to goodness. Okay, it's the last pause that's going to be in the game. He has... An HP that I don't know what it is yet. I'm assuming it's Ice at this point, because he used it on Gliscor before. He has Hydro Pump, he has Volt Switch, and he has a fourth move that he's never revealed. The safest play for him, you would think, most people would say, Hydro Pump. Okay, you can take him out. Looking at this position that he's in right now, I'm behind a sub. The smartest player in the world would keep subbing up. Hydro Pump has an 80% accuracy chance of hitting, and he only has eight of them. Now, at this point, he's also pressured, because if I get behind a sub safely and he misses twice, I can hit him with a Toxic. And um, he's going to start dying between Sandstorm and Toxic damage, so he'll be, accelerating, he'll be accelerating his own death. At the same time, I also have Toxic, or not Toxic, I have Protect and Substitute. So on the off chance that I just keep going for Protects and Substitutes, he's going to run out. My opponent probably makes the smartest move here. He goes for his HP. Now, unfortunately for this situation, it's an HP Grass. Now, again, looking at the damage that it's going to do, thank you, texts. Looking at the damage it's going to do, I'm just going to keep going for Protect. He has 24 Hidden Power Grasses, okay? But at the same time, it's like, why would you risk a Hydro Pump? It is at the end of the battle, yes, and as you can see, he's not doing a ton of damage. But at this point, just knowing... Uh, yeah, it's Grass. But, it, from his explanation, it makes sense. I mean... Why would you go for... I can stall out his Hydro Pumps and he's going to be struggling. So either way at this point, he recognizes that he's in a corner, right? If Hydro Pump misses, he's screwed, right? And I, I, I question the same thing. I said, why wouldn't you just want to go for Hydro Pump? Because you're at the end of the battle. Kind of like my same situation before, right? Why didn't I go on Overheat for the Heracross? Because either way, I'm using Logic, right? And the same thing he's using. He's using Logic. He's got eight Hydro Pumps. I've got two stalling moves. He's dying to Sandstorm and Toxic now. And that's pretty much going to be the game for him. So he knows that the, his best bet is to get crits with hit HP Grass, which are going to hit. And he's got 24 of them. And, you know, in order for me to Toxic him, I would have to be either getting lucky to stay behind a sub, which I'm not going to be able to since his HP Grass can break my subs, and that I would have to take a turn to be exposed, possibly get a crit, and then I can get hit by that. So that was an excellent match. You, Metagross, and Lee the Fan. Comment, rate, and subscribe, brother. And I hope you enjoyed this tutorial on the safe play. Hopefully I've explained enough of it. I didn't touch on every single thing that I talked about, but if you guys want to look back over the battle, leave comments, leave suggestions. If you want to add your own two cents, if you want to tell me I'm an idiot, go for it. I really just wanted to bring this today because I figured you guys haven't seen something very analytical from me in a long time. Nothing no, nothing in the ways of build the teams. It's just been a whole bunch of sub-decent battles and good predicting and here and there, but you needed a real explanation as to how people were thinking at this point. So that's what I decided to bring today. I swear to goodness you will not have another 40 minute or however long this is going to be upload in the future uh, for a long time anyways. But if you guys like this, also leave a comment in the section below as to what you would like to hear about next. And maybe I could do a tiny bit of research on it, but generally, like I said, I like to teach based off of my experiences. So if you're still here, thank you so much for watching, and I will see you next time. Until then, everyone, have an excellent day. Peace.